Counsel, do you think they take up before the jury comes in? Judge, just one quick clarifying matter. We do have the one large screen here in the courtroom. The state is going to be utilizing it to publish various aspects. We have a couple of different methods for publication. It's my understanding that your law clerk is also participating via Zoom. I just wanted you to be aware that she'll be able to see the courtroom, but she won't always be able to see what exhibit is being published. That's fine. Okay. No problem. Okay. Any preliminary matter? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Let's bring in the jury. Thank you. 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 Thank
After you have heard the instructions, the state and the defense will each be given time for closing arguments. In their closing arguments, they will summarize the evidence to help you understand how it relates to the law. Just as the opening statements are not evidence, neither are the closing arguments. After the closing arguments, you will leave the courtroom together to make your decision. During your deliberations, you will have with you my instructions, the exhibits admitted into evidence, and any notes taken by you in court. Instruction number three. This criminal case has been brought by the state of Idaho. I will sometimes refer to the state as the prosecution. As I mentioned to you earlier, the state is represented at this trial by prosecuting attorneys Stanley Mortensen, Julia Schopstall, and Arthur Verheren. Jason Johnson represents the defendant, Daniel Howard. Instruction number four. Under our law and system of justice, the defendant is presumed to be innocent. The presumption of innocence means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove his or her innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. Second, the state must prove the alleged crimes beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from lack of evidence. If, after considering all the evidence, you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. <clears throat> Instruction number five. Your duties are to determine the facts to apply the law set forth in my instructions to those facts, and in this way to decide the case. In so doing, you must follow my instructions regardless of your own opinion of what the law is or should be, or what either side may state the law to be. You must consider them as a whole, not picking out one and disregarding others. The order in which the instructions are given has no significance as to their relative importance. The law requires that your decision be made solely upon the evidence before you. Neither sympathy nor prejudice should influence you in your deliberations. Faithful performance by you of these duties is vital to the administration of justice. In determining the facts, you may consider only the evidence admitted in this trial. This evidence consists of the testimony of the witnesses, the exhibits offered and received, any stipulated or admitted facts. The production of evidence in court is governed by rules of law. At times during the trial, an objection may be made to a question asked a witness, or to a witness's answer, or to an exhibit. This simply means that I am being asked to decide a particular rule of law. Arguments on the admissibility of evidence are designed to aid the court and are not to be considered by you nor affect your deliberations. If I sustain an objection to a question or to an exhibit, the witness may not answer the question or the exhibit may not be considered. Do not attempt to guess what the answer might have been or what the exhibit might have shown. Similarly, if I tell you not to consider a particular statement or exhibit, you should put it out of your mind and not refer to it or rely on it in your later deliberations. During the trial, I may have to talk with the parties about the rules of law which should apply in this case. Sometimes we'll talk right here at the bench, and other times I will excuse you from the courtroom so that you can be comfortable while we work out any problems. You are not to speculate about any such discussions. They are necessary from time to time and help the trial run more smoothly. Some of you have probably heard the terms circumstantial evidence, direct evidence, and hearsay evidence. Do not be concerned with these terms. You are to consider all the evidence admitted in this trial. However, the law does not require you to believe all the evidence. As a sole judges of the facts, you must determine what evidence you believe and what weight you attach to it. There is no magical formula by which one may evaluate testimony. You bring with you to this courtroom all of the experience and background of your lives. In your everyday affairs, 
You determine for yourselves whom you believe, what you believe, and how much weight you attach to what you are told. The same considerations that you use in your everyday dealings in making these decisions are the considerations which you should apply in your deliberations. In deciding what you believe, do not make your decision simply because more witnesses may have testified one way than the other. Your role is to think about the testimony of each witness you heard and decide how much you believe of what that witness had to say. A witness who has special knowledge in a particular matter may give an opinion on that matter. In determining the weight to be given such opinion, you should consider the qualifications and credibility of the witness and the reasons given for the opinion. You are not bound by such opinion. Give it the weight, if any, to which you deem it entitled. Instruction number six. If during the trial I may say or do anything which suggests to you that I am inclined to favor the claims or position of any party, you will not permit yourself to be influenced by any such suggestion. I will not express nor intend to express, nor will I intend to intimate any opinion as to which witnesses are or are not worthy of belief, what facts are or are not established, or what inferences should be drawn from the evidence. If any expression of mine seems to indicate an opinion relating to any of these matters, I instruct you to disregard it. Instruction number seven, do not concern yourself with the subject of penalty or punishment. That subject must not in any way affect your verdict. If you find the defendant guilty, it will be my duty to determine the appropriate penalty or punishment. As I indicated to you earlier, the death penalty is not a sentencing option for the court or the jury in this case. Instruction number nine. It is alleged that the crime charged was committed on a certain date. If you find the crime was committed, the proof need not show that it was committed on that precise date. Instruction number ten. If you wish, you may take notes to help you remember what witnesses said. If you do take notes, please keep them to yourself until you and your fellow jurors go to the jury room to decide the case. You should not let note-taking distract you so that you do not hear other answers by witnesses. When you leave at night, please leave your notes in the jury room where they will be locked and not, not viewed. If you do not take notes, you should rely on your own memory of what was said and not be overly influenced by the notes of other jurors. In addition, you cannot assign to one person the duty of taking notes for all of you. And at the end of the case, the, at the conclusion, our, our beds will take your notes and shut them so they won't be read by you. I know you've heard this instruction many times, but let me sum it up anyway. Instruction number 11. It is important that as jurors and officers of this court, you obey the following instructions at any time you leave the jury box. Whether it be for recesses of the court during the day, or when you leave the courtroom to go home at night. Do not discuss this case during the trial with anyone, including any of the attorneys, parties, witnesses, your friends, or members of your family. No discussion also means no emailing, text messaging, tweeting, blogging, posting to electronic bulletin boards, and any other form of communication, electronic or otherwise. Do not discuss this case with other jurors until you begin your deliberations at the end of the trial. Do not attempt to decide the case until you begin your deliberations. I will give you some form of this instruction every time we take a break. I do that not to insult you or because I don't think you are paying attention, but because experience has shown this is one of the hardest instructions for jurors to follow. I know of no other situation in our culture where we ask strangers to sit together, watching and listening to something, then go into a little room together and not talk about the one thing they have in common, what they just watched together. But there are at least two reasons for this rule. The first is to help you keep an open mind. When you talk about things, you start to make decisions about them. And it is extremely important that you not make any decisions about this case until you have heard all of the evidence 
and all the rules for making your decisions. And you won't have that until the very end of the trial. The second reason for this rule is that we want all of you working together on this decision when you deliberate. If you have conversations in groups of two or three during the trial, you won't remember to repeat all of your thoughts and observations for the rest of your fellow jurors when you deliberate at the end of the trial. Ignore any attempted improper communication. If any person tries to talk to you about this case, tell that person that you cannot discuss the case because you are a juror. If that person persists, simply walk away and report the incident to the bailiff. Do not make any independent personal investigations into any facts or locations connected with this case. Do not look up any information from any source, including the internet. Do not communicate any private or special knowledge about any of the facts of this case to your fellow jurors. Do not read or listen to any news reports about this case or about anyone involved in this case, whether those reports are in newspapers or the internet or on radio or television. In our daily lives, we may be used to looking for information online and to Google something as a matter of routine. Also, in a trial, it can be very tempting for jurors to do their own research to make sure they are making the correct decision. You must resist that temptation for our system of justice to work as it should. I specifically instruct you that you must decide the case only on the evidence received here in court. If you communicate with anyone about the case or do outside research during the trial, it could cause us to have to start the trial over with new jurors could be held in contempt of court. While you are actually deliberating in the jury room, the bailiff will confiscate all cell phones and other means of electronic communication. Should you need to communicate with me or anyone else during the deliberations, please notify the bailiff. Instruction number 12. Each count charges a separate and distinct offense. You must decide each count separately on the evidence and the law that applies to it, uninfluenced by your decision as to any other count. The defendant may be found guilty or not guilty on some or all of the offenses charged. The clerk will now read the indictment and state the defendant's plea. Remember the indictment is simply a description of the charge. It is not evidence. In the District Court of the First Judicial District of the State of Idaho, in and for the County of Kootenai, State of Idaho Plaintiff, Daniel Charles Howard, Defendant, Count 1, that the Defendant, Daniel Charles Howard, on or about the 10th day of July, 2020, in Kootenai County, Idaho, did, in committing a battery, inflict a traumatic injury or injuries upon the person of Kendi Howard, to wit, redness to her ear and bruising to her chest and arm, and for Kendi Howard and the Defendant were household members. Count 2, that the Defendant, Daniel Charles Howard, on or about the 2nd day of February, 2021, in Kootenai County, Idaho, did unlawfully, deliberately, with malice, aforethought, and with premeditation, kill Kendi Howard, a human being, to wit, by asphyxiating her, all of which is contrary to the form, force, and effect in the statute in such case made and provided, and against the peace and dignity of the people of the State of Idaho. To these charges, he pled not guilty. Stanley T. Mortensen, Kootenai County Prosecutor, Parker Herron, Deputy Prosecutor. Thank you. Before we begin, I believe the parties had, earlier when I spoke with you all, had agreed to exclude witnesses at such time, except at such time as they are testifying, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. We will turn now to opening statements. Stanley, go first. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Normally I would move about, but I 
want to stay out of your way of the screen. Before I begin, I want to say that there are a lot of witnesses in this case, and my office is going to do its best to put them in chronological order. However, we've got about 50 or 60 witnesses, and some of them are coming from Seattle, some are coming from Pennsylvania, some are coming from Salt Lake, and they have some schedules we'd like to keep in mind. And so the order of the witnesses may be out of order, but we're going to ask you to look at the evidence in its totality. It's almost going to be a, somewhat like a Quentin Tarantino movie. Anyway, the last thing I want to say before I begin is that what I'm going to tell you is not evidence. I'm going to tell you how I believe the evidence is going to come in and what the evidence will show. So with that, I want to introduce you to Kenny Howard. Kenny was a mother of two adult children. Kenny was a grandmother. Kenny worked for Kootenai Health for nearly 20 years. Kenny loved bubble baths. She loved life and had future plans. This is Kenny Howard's family. She was the daughter of Wendell and Janie Wilkins. Kenny had a brother, Brian. Kenny had a daughter, Brooke. When Brooke was one year old, she met and married Dan Howard. And together they had one son, Wyatt. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce to you the state's motto. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Sir Arthur Doyle wrote this. He created a character we all know and love, Sherlock Holmes. Over a hundred years ago, Sherlock Holmes, perhaps the most famous detective of all time, spoke these words. These are the words I want you to remember throughout this trial. You've heard this before. It's just called something else. We call it process of elimination or just simple logic. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Howard is an ex-Marine. I mentioned to you earlier he had a law enforcement career. He started that career in California. And it was in California where he first trained with what is called the carotid restraint technique. And you're going to hear about that technique. It is different than a chokehold. Chokehold is when you cut somebody's oxygen off. Carotid restraint is when you cut their blood flow off. And when you cut somebody's blood flow off, they pass out. But when you apply that technique too long, they die. Dan Howard moved to Idaho, became a deputy sheriff in Idaho County, and then in 1994 he became an Idaho State Trooper. And he stayed there for 20 years and he received a lot of training and experience, to include SWAT. He was a firearms instructor. He was a defensive tactics instructor. He had the training, knowledge, and experience to be able to process crime scenes and collect evidence. I'm talking about DNA, I'm talking about fingerprints, I'm talking about ballistics. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two sides to that coin. Having the ability to read a crime scene and collect evidence also gives you the ability to stage a crime scene and not leave evidence. After leaving law enforcement, Dan would go to Alaska for three weeks at a time where he was an equipment operator in the Alaska North Slope. Then he'd come home for three weeks. Then he'd go to work for three weeks. Then he'd come home for three weeks. And that's how this story starts. Dan Howard is in charge with domestic battery. On July 10th of 2020, Kennedy calls 911. She does not disclose much to the cops. 
The next day, however, she starts sending one of her best friends pictures. And these pictures are, are bruising on her body. In the days following, Kendi and Dan go camping with some friends. One of these friends is the friend that Kendi was sending these bruises to her in picture. When Kendi shows up, the friend sees the bruises in person. That's count one, domestic battery. Following this, Kendi starts preparing to divorce Dan. Kendi, she gets a prescription for Prozac. She obtains it from a weight loss clinic. Kendi has fallen in love and begun a romantic relationship with somebody she met in high school. This is somebody who her parents know and are hanging out with. Kendi's beginning to move on with her life. Kendi's in the process of buying a house in Kamii. Closing date in April, months away. She buys a hot tub, other various items, and makes plan to renovate this new home she's buying. It's new to her. It's used. Kendi even tells her co-workers here at Kootenai Health that she's going to be getting a new job down in Kamii. She schedules a mommy makeover appointment, tummy tuck, breast augmentation, plans for the future, plans for her new life away from Dan. She buys new prescription glasses at Costco. She's constantly sharing plans with her friends, family, and her boyfriend. Together, Dan and Kendi have over $2 million in assets in an Idaho, we call that community property. They have a house on 10 acres in Athol. They have two parcels of land in Spirit Lake. They have toys, they have a tractor, vehicles, motorcycle, boat, camper. Retirements, each of them have their own retirements. A lot of cash. Hardly any debt. Again, community property means that in the divorce, Kendi is going to get half of everything, even Dan's law enforcement retirement. <coughs> January 2021, on the 26th, Kendi meets with the divorce attorney. This is happening when Dan is in Alaska. Her family knows Dan doesn't know yet. He's working in Alaska. She meets with the defense attorney who explains the divorce process and answers her questions. Kendi leaves the meeting with divorce paperwork in hand. Two days later, Kendi <coughs> wakes Dan up from the airport. He's returning home from Alaska. She tells Dan that she wants a divorce. She fills out the divorce paperwork with Dan. Next day, Kendi wakes up early in the morning. Dan is standing over her. Kendi sees that Dan is dressed in dark clothing and wearing gloves. Dan's holding an object. Kendi sees a handgun magazine laying on the floor. Kendi calls her boyfriend, who in turn calls her parents, and Kendi's mom calls 911. Kendi tells the officers that she thinks Dan was about to kill her. Kendi leaves the house that night, drives to Kamii, and stays with her parents. A few days later, Kendi returns. On February 1st, Dan and Brian, who are friends, this is Kendi's brother, Brian, they work in Alaska together. Dan's father needs help moving something about three hours south of town. Dan picks Brian up, and they drive down south. It's a three-hour trip, a lot to talk about. I think Brian maybe lives halfway between, so maybe an hour and a half between the two of them. Dan is suspicious that Kendi's having an affair. So Dan confronts Brian with this, and Brian confirms that Kendi is having an affair. Dan doesn't sleep that night. Brian can hear Dan pacing 
all night. The next day they wake up. Dan drives recklessly the whole way back to town. Same day, February 2nd. Kendi's last day. Kendi goes to work. Kendi hears that her new home has passed inspection. Kendi gets her nails done. This is somebody who isn't suicidal. Kendi goes to McDonald's on her way home to Athol and gets dinner. Later that night, Dan calls 911. Tells law enforcement that Kendi shot herself. Deputies arrive. Detectives arrive. Red flags are going up. Some very experienced deputies and detectives are starting to become suspicious of what they see. They find Kendi naked in a bathtub. Even brand new, inexperienced deputies are starting to notice that things are not adding up. Crime scene. Dan says Kendi shot herself. Gunshot wound to the mouth is found. No witnesses. Dan's the only one in the house. Officers notice some things. Again, Kendi's naked in the bathtub. Water was still warm. There's bubbles in it. Dan appears to be crying. There's no tears. None of Kendi's clothes are found in the bathroom. There's glass on the bedroom floor. There's a lot less blood in the bathroom than the deputies would expect after somebody's been shot in the mouth. Dan has fresh deodorant on his shirt. There are clothes in the dryer. Wood-burning stove is cooking. When somebody dies, it's very common for the body to go to Spokane, where there's an autopsy. This autopsy was performed by a pathologist, a medical examiner. This medical examiner had a long career and done hundreds of autopsies. He was about to retire. This is Dr. Howard, no relation to Dan. Dr. Howard has short timer's disease. He's showing up to work, he's performing autopsies, but his colleagues are noticing he's kind of checked out. The autopsy fails to recognize some important things that the detectives are picking up on. Kendi has bruising on her body that got there before she died. Medical experts can determine that on various places of her body. There's a second degree thermal burn on Kendi's arm. People get into the bathtub with a burn. It hurts. It's a reason why people don't get into the water when they have a burn on their arm. Argument. Sorry? Argument. I'll move on, Your Honor. The evidence will show that Kendi suffered a broken jaw before she died. Evidence will show that Kendi had signs of suffocation on her body to include bruising on her chest. Evidence will show that there was a lack of blood at the crime scene. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a timeline here. February 2nd is the day of Kendi's death. February 3rd is the autopsy. Almost five and a half months later, we get a coroner's report. After an autopsy, the autopsy then goes back to Kootenai County and our Kootenai County coroner reviews the death, all the evidence. And when a coroner gets all this evidence, they have to fit the death 
into one of five categories. Was this death natural causes? Cancer. Was this death an accident? Were they hiking and they slipped off the cliff and they fell to their death? Was this a suicide? Was this a homicide? When the coroner can't pick one of those four, they pick undetermined. And that is exactly what happened in this case. The sheriff's office considered that another red flag. After receiving the coroner's report, a two-year investigation was conducted into Kenny's death. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will come in and will demonstrate that this was not a suicide. There will also be evidence that this was a homicide. Evidence will show that Kenny died of asphyxiation. That's the result of a carotid restraint. Something Dan knew how to do. Evidence will show that Kenny was shot in her mouth, but that that happened after she was already dead. This explains the lack of the blood at the crime scene. When somebody's dead, their heart slows down and then stops beating. When the heart is slowing down and stops beating, less blood is leaving the body. Loss or lack of blood at the crime scene. The evidence will show that this scene was staged to look like a suicide. Three questions. Who? Who had the opportunity? Well, Dan was the only other one in the house. Evidence will show you that. How? Who had the ability to stage a crime scene? Dan had the law enforcement training and experience needed to hide or leave little evidence at the scene. Why? What's the motive? Kendi was going to take half of everything in the divorce. One million dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, after hearing all this evidence, you are going to have information that the coroner did not have when ruling Kendi's death undetermined. After all the evidence comes in, you're going to be able to rule out natural causes. You're going to be able to rule out accident. If it's suicide or homicide, it's undetermined. But you're going to hear evidence that this was not a suicide. Ladies and gentlemen, if it's not suicide, it's no longer undetermined. Model of the case, if you eliminate the impossible, all that's left is the truth. This evidence will show that Dan Howard is guilty of murder. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martinson. Mr. Johnson, you're okay? You will hear that Ken Kenny was living a double life for quite some time. And speaking about impossible, you will hear from the state's psychological expert that it is impossible to determine Kennedy's suicidality, whether she was suicidal. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Jason Johnson. Your Honor, Madam Ladies, gentlemen of the jury, counsel. I want to start with tonight of February 2nd. Dan calls 911 about 10.45. You'll hear that he stayed on the phone his demeanor on that 911 call, weeping, particularly when the dispatcher or the 911 operator mistakes that he was calling about his son about two, three minutes into the call instead of his wife. She asked him, how old is your son? And he was confused. And he, that reaction there. And law enforcement shows up, and they initially, they, they Officer or Deputy Wheeler, who's relatively new, makes some observations. Well, his cheeks are red, he's, he's crying, but 
I don't see tears. Uh, and he takes some initial photos. At that point, it's a death investigation. Officers show up, detectives show up, uh, three detectives, uh, Detective Boyler, Detective Boyler, and Detective Lalita. And obviously, in this type of case, death investigation, you're going to do some due diligence and rule out anything um, untoward. But Detective Northrop then takes photos seven hours later, six to seven hours later, uh, based upon the timestamps of the photos, where she's still in the tub, still with blood. The, cor the a medical examiner uh, refers to a bloodline across her body where she had been sitting in the tub and the water had gone down and you see that blood one. You'll see the amount of blood caked on her back when she was removed from the autopsy examination. They uh, do their investigation. Initially they conduct a search warrant at that time. And they leave about 9.45. Officers and law enforcement leave about 9.45 on the 3rd, uh, the morning of the 3rd. Later that morning, autopsy was performed by Dr. Howard. And Dr. Howard specifically found that the cause of death... Objection, Your Honor. Sidebar? Yes. Members of the jury, this is going to take a little longer conversation with the attorneys, so I'm going to excuse you uh, shortly um, while I continue discussing with the lawyers. All rise, please. Thank you. 
to state your objection. Thank you. Your Honor, I'm going to try to keep this very simple and short. This was litigated well before trial. Dr. Howard's conclusions are hearsay. They can't come in except through Dr. Howard. Now, there are going to be some experts in this case who rely on other people's work to include Dr. Howard's work. But those experts are going to be testifying about their own opinions. Dr. Howard's work, his opinions cannot come in. It's just hearsay. Just because something's written in a report, just because something's provided to the defense, and just because something's given to another expert in formulating their own opinions, doesn't mean that everything comes in. Everything that comes into evidence has to comply with the rules of evidence. And this is rank hearsay. And this is litigated, and the court gave a ruling on this. We're getting close to sanctionable. I don't think the defense should be permitted to get into this, especially in opening statements. We have no way of knowing what evidence is going to come in. And this is something, again, that's just been litigated, and Mr. Johnson should be held with the rules to send it to statements. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, as mentioned, it's very clear from both our experts and state's experts that every single expert has reviewed the autopsy report and has made a conclusion on whether or not they agree or disagree with the cause of death. For instance, Dr. Desmond, a defense expert, has reviewed everything, done the biomechanical engineering and all that. Detective Lallican had a conversation with the replacement of Dr. Howard in January of last year, trying to see if there was anything different that he could find. And he did. Dr. Mott confirmed that the cause of death was gunshot wound to the neck. That's why, frankly, I think it's disingenuous for the state four weeks before trial to change their theory and why we wanted to... Let me get up there. That's not what we're talking about. This was the subject of a motion in limine, specifically that any opinion of Dr. Howard as to the cause of death being gunshot wound, unless offered by Dr. Howard himself. He's on call, Your Honor. Well, I granted the motion in limine, and I'm not allowing that until such time as that comes in as testimony. I think it's, at least as I understood from the motion in limine, it's debatable whether or not he ultimately is testifying and if that ultimately is his opinion. And you cannot bootstrap it through other experts putting his opinion in. Again, we have this hearing. I'm relying on the arguments made at the motion in limine at the time I granted it. So I'm sustaining the objection not to provide that opinion in an opening statement. We would take exception to the right, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, we'll bring the jury in. I'll expect you to move forward with your opening without reference to Dr. Howard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. You may continue, Mr. Johnson. The evidence shows that Ms. Howard had a gunshot wound to the neck.
shot in lodged in C2. That breathing was coming from the mouth. That the bullet went through the tongue. You'll see the gun. It's a 380. Kind of a short, not like a normal gun with a long barrel. So the gun with a, a stub nose or a short barrel that would not be able to go past the teeth and rest on the tongue. You'll hear that during the course of the investigation, Detective Valentin and others went up to Alaska to see if Mr. Howard was out of the affair. They didn't find any. You'll hear about the affair that Ms. Howard kept secret from even her best friends. During the course of the investigation, there were a second search warrant done a couple weeks later in February 17th. They go to the house, they examine various things, and then at this time, they send items to ballistics. They send they use Washington State Patrol, uh, they have a forensic unit, to examine some of the evidence. During that time, uh, Washington State Patrol found several key things. The gun had Kennedy's blood on it, on one of the grips. It had her DNA on it and another male's DNA. Dan was excluded from the gun. You'll hear that the coroner uh, listed this as initially the photos that she had saved are called Howard Suicide. But as the course of the investigation, uh, Detective Valentin very quickly believed that there was something untoward about Dan. And that's based upon when Dan was finally, he was on 911 when officers showed up. And at some point later in the morning, they let him start doing notifications. He called his son. He called Brooke, his, his uh, stepdaughter. That phone call you'll hear was short. You'll hear that right after that, a few minutes later, she called back. When she called back, naturally, uh, she sounded upset, and Detective Lallaton overheard that conversation. And from then, he started, he specifically started accusing Dan who did this, didn't you? And Detective Lallaton conducted a couple of years of investigation trying to um, find Dan. At some point, uh, officers obviously fill out police reports, detectives fill out police reports. The first time a police report mentions anything about a carotid restraint wasn't until April of 2023. Prior to that, uh, Detective Lallaton had a conversation with the replacement uh, Dr. Ma, a replacement for uh, Dr. Howard when, after he had retired, to see if his opinions would be any different. It wasn't until after that that sometime in his police report there's a mention of a lot of restraint. But you'll hear that there is no damage to the high boy. There is no petechia. She just had her nails done. There is no DNA or, or uh, samples uh, from Dan under her fingernails. There is no defensive wounds from, uh, from being uh, restrained that Ms. Howard put on, on Dan. You hear that she took a bath every night. You also hear that that night, she had an iPhone, and it, like a lot of iPhones, it keeps track of your steps. 
You'll see that she went up the floor to a nightly routine, took a bath. You'll see that at one point, about 10 11, 10, 11-ish, she took 43 steps. There's a, a wet uh, towel in the bedroom. Her purse was now in the bathroom where she normally kept the gun. 43 steps. The bath, mat was wet, but nothing else around was wet. Just the bathroom. 43 steps. You will hear that uh, uh, from uh, one of the defense experts, that Dr. Deswoman, that when he examined the evidence and the scene, that it is consistent. The body position, the mechanics, the gun placement, it's consistent with suicide. The, we talked about Philip Painter, Dr. Hanner. You'll hear about some of the things that would lead to suicide. Dr. Hanger you know, will testify that a person who's trying to break off from alcohol is susceptible to uh, suicide. You'll hear that she is not content with her body. She is struggling with whether she wants to leave Dan even after uh, everything went down. In fact, what you will hear is that her brother and her got in a huge fight. The last text that Miss Howard sent was to her friend Tana about how her brother had blocked her because they got in a fight. Brother. So during all this investigation, uh, members of the state uh, investigators, uh, Ms. Marhofer, was going through the phones. While going through the phones, she came across a photo from about seven months prior, from July of 2020. This photo has a large, large bruise that kind of trails up to the center. Also, she has a bruising on her arm. It's red. She had sent her paramour, her secret lover, Mr. Prado, and her friend Michelle messages around that time. And she never specifically says, Dan did it. But you'll hear that two other people were present. Neighbors who saw her when they, uh, they were there, uh, their neighbors, and they were loaded up the boat to go to Dorshack. Uh, Dan and Kenny were loaded up the boat. And she had slipped on the step that leads uh, to the front of the boat where the trolling motor is. On the 10th of July, law enforcement was called. And you may hear that call, and you can make your observations about that call. But she's uh, calling, and it's hysterical. I think Dan committed suicide. I heard a gunshot. Uh, I hear it is very common for Dan to uh, fire guns, and he's got a large parcel, an apple, to fire guns. And so, um, I don't know if we'll have an answer why that would surprise her. But, law enforcement shows up, and she specifically denies any physical abuse. They are in Dorshack, and you'll, you'll see pictures of them at Dor Dorshack. Loving, uh, in a bathing suit, crew shown. Uh, but that is the basis of the battery charge. During this time, Dan, for several years, has been working in construction. First in North Dakota, then in, in uh, Alaska. He's working in the oil fields. 
three weeks on to three weeks off. Dan and Candy were on the rocks. He came back two days late. He worked an extra two days. When they came back, they talked about the force. They would stop at, at uh, Curly's. They then went home. And later that night, uh, later that night, 911 gets a call. Now, she was on the phone with her, her lover, who then got in touch with the parents. You'll hear that the differences between those two, between July when she called 911, to where she was on the phone with someone else to have someone else call. Law enforcement shows up. He is not in dark clothing. He's in like these tan greenish khakis and a sweatshirt. Coincidentally, the same clothes that were in the washer a few nights later. Officers stay there. Uh, she packs a bag, a Victoria's Secret uh, travel bag, and uh, leaves. She comes back the next day, brings a beer and pizza. She spends the, the next two days and they're filling out divorce paperwork. Ms. Howard is email or uh, messaging her friends, uh, saying he's being an alcohol or is it, um, uh, we're, we're dividing everything up. And you'll see photos of the paperwork that is partially filled out. Dan goes down with Brian on first. And then on the second, uh, they came back and when they had a conversation, what's now on the paperwork is the new house. The house that was purchased is now on it. That was something that uh, you'll hear about. What you will see is Miss Howard, when she was uh, put in the body bag, they put um, bags on her hand to preserve for gunshot residue. They collected the gunshot residue. They sent it to the lab, but they, lab, they didn't have the lab tested. We already talked about the DNA. Dan, the gun was not, the gun had someone else's DNA and her blood on it, but Dan is excluded from that, that gun. You'll see the blood amount. You'll hear that after a person is dead, the volume of blood will depend on a few variables, but generally the blood will pump for, you'll hear, around maybe a half second or, or a little more, depending on the cause and manner of death. But your, the heart stops pumping. Also, the position of the body, you'll hear that. The person's lying down, the person's sitting up, the person's slumped. Where the injury is, is it below the heart, is it above the heart? Uh, here, you'll see the blood, it, the the injury was too interoral. And you'll hear from both, uh, all the other that most interoral gunshot wounds are suicide. But the odd part is most interoral gunshot wounds have an upward trajectory. Now, this one, everyone agrees, is a, a even or slightly downward trajectory. But again, this is a, a different gun, and you'll hear from Dr. Desmond that one of the scenarios is that she held it with her thumb on the trigger, which would lower that angle of the gun. She also, you'll hear, has bruising on this hand from the impact of the gun. You'll see that her her hand position and the gun position is consistent with suicide. 
when you see all the evidence and we have concluded this case, the evidence is not impossible and has not been eliminated. And therefore, we'll be asking you to find the defendant not guilty. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. State and call us for witness. Before that happens, Your Honor, can we excuse the jury for just five minutes? Put something on the record? Okay. All right. Send you back out again. Just a few minutes. Why don't you discuss the case among yourselves? Thank you. Your Honor, I have a broad concern. I didn't object, but during opening statements, the defense alluded to this phone call and the belief that Mr. Howard may have shot himself, committed suicide. I do believe that was the topic of some pre-trial litigation. I believe there was a ruling on that. And the reason why I'm growing concerned is because twice now, during opening statements, the defense has disregarded court rulings. And this puts the state at a severe disadvantage. If I were doing that, this would be prosecutorial misconduct. But yet, this attitude that, well, I'm the defense attorney. I can get away with it. What's going to happen? It's going to be a mistrial. And we'll have to do this some other day. That attitude cannot be tolerated. The state has no remedy here except to ask for sanctions or to file a bar complaint. The court could file a bar complaint. I'm asking the court to admonish the defense to adhere to prior court rulings. The state is entitled to a fair trial just as much as Mr. Howard. And so I would ask the court to address that before we get into evidence. And this can't wait until whether or not the defense puts on a case to chief. The defense gets to ask leading questions on cross-examination. If Mr. Johnson is going to build hearsay and inadmissible evidence into his questioning of state's witnesses, the jury's going to hear that before I get to object. And again, Your Honor, if this is going to be the attitude moving forward or Mr. Johnson's tactics, the state is at a severe disadvantage. So I would just ask the court to please revisit with the defense prior court rulings and admonish them to follow those orders. Thank you. Well, I guess first I'd like to be a little more specific of what he's referring to. Because if he's referring to Detective Alton having a conversation during the course of the investigation, I did not refer to what Dr. Mott said, number one. I referred to a conversation that Detective Alton had. That's within the scope. There's not been a pretrial motion on that. I don't think Dr. Mott himself has come up with a pretrial motion. We did not give an opinion or refer to an opinion of Dr. Mott. I referred to Detective Alton's actions. He called or had a conversation with Dr. Mott regarding whether he disagreed with the autopsy. That's not subject to a pretrial ruling. That's fair game in cross. That's an appropriate question. And if the answer is different than what I presented, then I look bad. If he did have that conversation. But we know he did because we have the police report. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm not sure that's what the concern is. I think it was the, maybe you can spell it out, but the references to. Sure. And I thought the pretrial ruling, I think it was actually Judge Meyer's pretrial ruling, was that the gunshot that caused Kennedy to call the police, it wasn't clear that it was a gunshot and the state was going to 
and he was prohibited from referring to this uh, as a suicide attack. And then you just opened that door wide open by referring to it as, well, this wasn't suicide, why don't you call the police? So I, I don't know that it's sanctionable as much as it just opens the door for the state to talk about it as they, I mean, they're not bound by that pre-trial anymore. Um, okay. So if, if you want to open that door, um, I mean, you did. <laughs> so I'll say the state's no longer bound by that pre-trial anymore. That prohibits the state from talking about it. Um, I, I am, uh, I'm a little concerned, and I, maybe not to the same level the state's argument, but that um, we had extensive, extensive pretrial motion practice and rulings. Um, a lot of those were oral rulings, just given the amount of time and trying to get them done, but I at least reduced them to writing terms like granted, denied, etc., so everyone would be able to refer back to it. And, um, and so I do uh, expect the parties to follow that and uh, abide by the court's rulings on those things. Um, Ms. Warren, am I correct that that's what you were referring to? Yes, Your Honor. There, there was 12B motions, and there was a written order from the court, and it was specifically regarding suicide attempt that I mentioned on that phone call. So, I think it was a, the state wasn't to refer to that as a suicide attempt or, or talk about that, but, um, but I would say that door is wide open. Yes. And again, this is the attitude, well, that was the defendant's motion. And the defense is fine if that door is open now. I, that, that's a poor attitude to have in trial. It, it, it's evidence of disregarding the court's order. Yeah, again, if I had that attitude and I was opening doors that shouldn't be opened, if I was disregarding court orders, We'd be having a much different conversation right now. I would just like to point that out, Your Honor. All right. Okay, let's um, bring the jury back in.
investigated the officer involved, um, shootings, and other incidents of that nature, as well as um, one of my other responsibilities was to investigate um, and conduct internal investigations uh, when there was accusations of wrongdoing by other police officers. In the Sheriff's Department, what did you do before that? Uh, well, before that, then I worked in the patrol division as a watch commander. Uh, before that time, I was my supervisor in the backcountry marine division. And before that, I worked as a um, narcotics officer with the Joint Drug Task Force. And before that, you worked with another law enforcement agency. I worked for two. Can you describe this? Um, <clears throat> prior to Cooking County, I worked for the Boundary County Sheriff's Office as a patrol deputy uh, for a couple of years. Before that, I worked for the Detroit County Sheriff's Office in Casper, Wyoming. So how many years total do you have uh, with law enforcement experience? Uh, approximately 30 before retiring. On February 2nd of 2021, did you become involved in the case involving Dan Howard? Yes, I did. Is he here today? Yes, he is. Can you please point him out, describe where he's seated, tell us what he's wearing? Uh, Mr. Howard is seated at the defense table. Um, he's closest to the jury. Grant. Tan, or I'm sorry, gray jacket, white colored, possibly pink shirt. Was this your case to begin with? No, it was not. Whose case was it? It was uh, Detective Sergeant Daryl Oiler. Ultimately, did it become your case? Um, yes. Why is that? Uh, because Sergeant Oiler retired from the sheriff's office. Nonetheless, were you active in the investigation, even though it wasn't yours to begin with? Yes, it was. When you arrived at um, the Howard's residence, uh, about what time was it? <clears throat> I believe Sergeant Oiler and I arrived at the residence about a quarter till midnight, 15 to 20 minutes before midnight. Were you called out from home? I was. And was he as well? Yes. When you got to the Howard's residence, was there other Kootenai County Sheriff's Department people there already? Yes. Describe that. Uh, Detective Jerry Northrup was parked um, outside the residence on the road awaiting our arrival. And uh, at the residence and inside was... Uh, Sergeant Sifford, who was a patrol watch commander, and approximately five other patrol deputies. Are you familiar with the Howard residence? Yes, I am. Can you tell us what the address is? Uh, 30267 North Wheat Bridge Road, Apple, Idaho, Cooley County. Have you been there before? Uh, I have. Are you familiar with the layout of the home? Yes, I am. And the ground surrounding it? Uh, yes. Let me show you some exhibits. They've been marked as 1, 2A, and 2B. I'll hand them to defense counsel, first of all. Ask you if you recognize 1A and 1. Are yes, I do. Do you recognize that? That is an aerial photograph of the Dan Howard property. On North Wheat Bridge Road. Is there an accurate layout of the buildings on that property? Uh, yes, it appears to be. Uh, and the next two are been marked as 2A and 2B. Take a look at those, starting with 2A. Would you recognize that to be? Uh, that appears to be the floor plan of the main level of the Dan Howard residence. And so by floor plan, you're referring to rooms. Walls, closets, beds, furniture, that kind of thing. Uh, that's correct. And then two B. That would be the basement area of Dan Howard's residence at three zero two six seven North Wheat Bridge Road in Apple Idaho. Okay. Again, showing the same items that two A had. Yes. Does this appear accurate in terms of the layout of the furniture uh, the house was back in February second, twenty twenty one? So that's my recollection, yes. Move to admit on board 2A and 2B. Still good. Exhibits 1, 2A, and 2B are in the 
published the same? Do you get it published? Okay, we're looking at 1A. So it looks like North Wheat Ridge Road is the access point to the Howard residence. Is that accurate? Uh, yes. Is US 95 close by? Uh, it's several miles to the east of this location. Okay. And looking down here, describe what we're viewing. Same with 2A. there initially and you went through the garage and you go into the living room, tell us what you can see. Well, when we arrived, we entered, I don't know, can you see that? Yeah. We entered through the open garage door into the main door. Uh, when I walked in, I could see Dan Howard's um, seated in the living room area. Uh, there were some deputies in the residence. Uh, we were then directed um, upstairs where in this main central bathroom um, I observed quite later, well, who I recognized to be Kenny Howard. Um, so you had met 
Candy Howard prior to this date. Yes. And was Candy Howard in that bathtub as depicted in 2A? I or at least say, approximately. Like I would say that's a reasonable diagram. Okay, and was she deceased? She was. Okay, after viewing um, Candy, did you go back downstairs? Yes. U ultimately, did you at some point uh, become familiar with, not the main floor, but downstairs? Yes. So what was depicted in 2A? I mean, excuse me, 2B. We'll take a look at that briefly, and maybe you can do the same thing that you've done with the other exhibits with that. So. search warrant was executed, having a, a very lengthy conversation with Dan Howard, I guess it would be the early morning hours of February 3rd, 2021. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily categorize it as lengthy because we took some breaks in between while we were waiting for this, the search warrant, but yes. Was it um, recorded? Yes, it was. And um, who recorded it? Um, Detective Sergeant Darrell Oiler. How? Using a body camera that both video and audio. All right. During the entire time, essentially? Uh, yeah, well, as far as I know, during our, the entire contact with Dan Howard, yes. Okay, so that those recordings are lengthy. They are. I just want to ask you some um, specific questions um, about that conversation that you and Detective Order had with Mr. Howard. We're going to watch those recordings next week at some point, okay? Okay. All right, so I know you told us that you've met Dan, B Dan Howard before. Have you talked with Dan Howard before? Yes, I have. Is Dan Howard the kind of person that looks you in the eye when he speaks to you? Yes. Would Dan Howard look you in the eye early that morning? Jackson Foundation. Lay a little bit more foundation about his um, interactions that would be able to make up foundation about. How many times have you spoken with Dan Howard since you've known him? Uh, probably a couple. When was the last time you had a conversation with Dan Howard? 
prior to this. Excuse me? Yes. Uh, would have been probably 10 years before this. And what was your relationship with Dan Howard back in 2014? Uh, Jeff, sure. The other times that you've talked to Dan Howard were when? Uh, prior to that 10 years? Prior to oh, prior February 2nd, 2021. It would have been about 10 years prior. Okay, and about how long were those conversations that you had with him? Uh, they were fairly lengthy. So you, you've had substantial contact with him in the past face to face? Yes. And in those prior contacts with, with him, would he look you in the eye? Objection. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, what, would he do that when you were talking to him on February 3rd in the early morning hours of his house? No, not consistently. What do you mean by that? Uh, during our contact that evening, Dan made very little eye contact with me. At times, did he make eye contact with you? At times, he did, yes. And, and what was his emotional level at the times he made eye contact with you, during the times that he did that morning? I would say he appeared to be frustrated or trying to explain something. Objection. Speculation. Did you ask him initially what had been going on between him and Kendi? Uh, yes, I did. What did he say? Uh, he indicated that they had been having some problems. Did he indicate to you whether or not they were speaking of divorce? Uh, he did. What did he say? Uh, he said that they had been talking about divorce. Did he give you a reason that he thought Kendi killed herself? Yes. What was that? Uh, his reason that evening, uh, explaining to Detective Euler and I, was that during um, the divorce paperwork that they were filling out, or he had filled out, um, he wanted to include a residence that she had made an offer on down in Kamei, Idaho, and that she got very upset over the fact that Dan wanted to include that in the divorce. Was this just a simply, simply a residence that she had put an offer on? That's correct. That she had not acquired? And she did not acquire it, no. Okay. And after he, or during the part where he gave you that reason that she killed herself, what did he tell you was the chain of events that occurred in terms of later on in the night? Did he indicate to you that she went up and took a bath? Uh, yes, she did. And then? Um, that later at some point he heard what he described to us as a thud. Okay. Um, he continued to fill out some paperwork, uh, work on the paperwork, have a beer or several uh, while watching television and doing some laundry. Did he give you a time frame in terms of hearing the thud upstairs and him going to check on Kendi? Ultimately, he estimated between one and one and a half hours. And what did he say 
he saw when he went upstairs to check in on Kendi. Uh, that he found Kendi uh, in the bathtub unresponsive. And did he describe to you the condition or temperature of her body? Warm. I'm sorry. Actually, I believe he told us that she was cold to the touch. At some point in your conversation with Mr. Howard, did you ask him whether or not he had shot a firearm that day? in conjunction with GSR testing? I didn't ask him those terms. At some point, did you use a ruse in speaking with Mr. Howard that involved gunshot residue testing? Yes. Why? I wanted to see what his reaction was going to be. Why? Uh, because at that point, I was... Well, we were all suspicious of the circumstances of Kenny's death. What is GSR? It's gun, uh, known as gunshot residue, and it occurs when you fire a weapon and you're in close proximity to it. It's, it's basically it's what's it's been described to me by scientists and experts. Like here, say. Response? Well, I think he's just explaining his general understanding of the term. This is an offer to, to definitively define it for the jury, but just his understanding of what this testing will involve. So GSR is um, the the powder residue when you fire a fire when you fire a gun. Uh, it's fine like flour, and it sticks to pretty much everything in proximity to that firearm when it's shot. And is it something that you've utilized in your career? Uh, yeah, I have in the past early on, but it's not something that we've used for many years. Why is that? Uh, basically because it's described as junk science. Checks and here's. And done this one. Yeah, it's just why he doesn't use it anymore. It's not for the truth of the matter, sir, the judge. Okay, I'll, I'll limit that for the jury, that he's not testifying as an expert as to gunshot residue, he's just explaining why he no longer uses it. To your knowledge, will only state lab in the country accept GSR testing? Not one that I'm aware of, no. Later on in the interview, did that topic of GSR testing or that um, issue come up in terms of whether or not he had shot a gun? Yes. Can you run us through that, please? I asked um, Mr. Howard if there was any reason he would have GSR on his person, his, on his hands or his body. His response? Uh, after a pause, he indicated that he had shot a, one of his handguns earlier that same day. Approximately, I believe, between 3.30 and 4 o'clock, somewhere around. And then did you and other detectives take some steps to actually engage in GSR testing? Uh, yes. Why? Um, because I had mentioned it, basically. And so one of the other detectives on scene uh, went ahead and, and swapped him for GSR. Did that provoke any responses from Mr. Howard that caught your attention? Uh, yes, it did. Describe that. Uh, he, as we were all standing out there in the right of his residence, he had shoved his hands in his front pants pockets and were shaking them, rubbing them back and forth in a very fast manner. To the point where one of the other, uh, well, Detective Boiler had to ask him to stop doing that. At a point in the investigation, did you allow Mr. Howard to tell his family about what had happened late earlier in the night? Yes, we did. About what time do you think that was? I believe it was, it was after 6 a.m. approximately. Why had you waited so long? 
Uh, while on one, we were waiting for the search warrant to get there. We didn't want any additional family members showing up on scene, and, and uh, we don't have to deal with any other issues. Because we didn't know what the state of their mind was going to be. Were you there when he called family members? Yes, uh, I was not there for the initial first, I believe, two. But I did witness and observe at least one of them. Right. Which one was that? Uh, that would have been when his stepdaughter broke. Okay. When he called Brooke, were you there? No, I believe he was downstairs with Detective Boyler at that time. When she called Dan back, were you there? Yes, I was. And were you there to hear whatever you could hear over the phone from her? I could hear it from across the room. And were you there to hear his responses? Yes, I was. What, who spoke first when she called Dan? I don't recall who spoke first. I, I believe it was probably his stepdaughter. Can, can you describe the conversation for us to the best of your memory? She was angry, she was upset, and she immediately accused Dan of killing her mother. And Dan's response? Um, he was visibly shaken um, and upset and denied it. Anything else to that conversation? I mean, that was the gist of it. She accused him and he denied it. From that point on, he was pretty upset. So this investigation, um, can you kind of give us general outlines of it? Did it involve execution of search warrants? Yes, it did. Quite a few. About how many and what sorts of businesses or institutions? Well, we did a, an initial search warrant that evening. Um, there was a second search warrant at the residence later um, approximately almost two weeks later, I believe. Um, and then from that point on, there was at least 12 to 15, 16 more search warrants that were written to various um, locations, banks, uh, Idaho State Tax Commission, uh, Percy, Kootenai Health, places of, of that nature. All right. Places where there would be records involving Dan and Candy? That's correct. You were obviously working the investigation and the coroner came back with the undetermined on the autopsy? I don't think I was actually still personally involved in the investigation uh, during that time frame. When you became involved in it, were you aware of that undetermined by the coroner? Yes, I was. Did the investigation, at least from your perspective, when you took it on, continue? Yes, it did. Why? Um, well, because of one. One, the initial um, response to the scene, uh, the incident that took place on the 29th prior to Kimmy's death, uh, Dan's reaction that evening, um, observations that were made not only by myself, but literally by every other officer that was on scene that, that night. Uh, the inconsistent statements from Dan that evening, um, the inconsistent, basically, crime scene or um, death scene where Kimmy Howard uh, was located. Um, there was concerns about injuries located on her person and her body that were not, also not consistent whatsoever with what Dan had uh, tried telling us earlier. In the investigation after search warrants were executed on various banks and the assessor and things like that, did the Sheriff's Department developed a possible motive. Yeah, yes we did. What was that? A um, couple of things. Uh, one, anger uh, over Kitty's affair. And probably the bigger one was the money. Did the investigation
investigation go to the area of Kenny's mental health at that time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that was, that was taken into account from day one. And was that a consideration in this investigation going forward, even though the coroner had ruled it undetermined? Yes, it was. Why is that? Oh, well, because we had to rule out that she didn't commit suicide, that she wasn't suicidal, that she wasn't depressed. Foundation. I understood that that was, you're asking why they continue investigating. Not Correct. That was a yet, so. I'll, I'll move on there, John. No further questions. Recording such a long thing right now. Here's pulled up. There's long chunks. Like I usually go like one long clip, but like there's there's clips because of the breaks in the jury. So you are already here tomorrow. Oh, the rest of the week. I know Gateway will be cool, but I don't know when. Is that the right path for it? No. Can I just... Yeah, you're fine. Three years, five years. Yeah, once you guys have a great setup too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just did they have the same kind of box as you. Um that, that's not like a box, but it's like a feed. Yeah, because Melissa's camera is the same as I don't even can you do the box? She's talking about like um, the splitter for the video cable. Mm -hmm. Gabe just keeps going. Gabe, yeah, Gabe for sure. Has yeah, I can I can Gabe bring one to talk at your station. Yeah, so Gabe's our chief of talk, but he was at the Geary trial. Yeah, just so it doesn't, just so it doesn't die on me, right? For yeah, so we'll be pulling up. I think my, I think Paul said Wednesday this week, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I'm not there. It'll, it'll be for sure be tomorrow. Oh. I, that's, I think we're, I think oh we're tomorrow on Wednesday. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm not sure. I'm assuming not sure. when we do pull it. probably should be fine. But I don't. I mean, it's like okay. it's like ten percent. But no one will be coordinating all of that, so we'll probably see you guys on Thursday. Okay. Just in case, if I need the other team, I'm not here. Okay. I just like wanted to fight me the day because I've literally charged him twice. I'll text him now. Say, hey, can you coordinate for the rest? Oh wait, does that have like oh? Does it have like this type of plugin? Let's do the box. Because you only record a certain amount of time. 
Oh my god. Wait. Yeah. I'm the chief Oh wait, no, no, no. We flirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Day, like, Thank you. Everywhere, so. <laughs> but you, you are on my trip. Yeah. This Friday. Yes. Yes. And it died. I am bringing an extension. I have to head out though after. Okay. Right now. And an extension. Like a power strip for like multiple. Yeah, no. Everything's basically already written. Yeah. Well, look live on the side, but then, yeah, package for whatever. So, it'll be. <laughs> no, we only have a five. And, well, we do have an eleven, but um, we 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 write like just a VO of those odds. Yeah. But no, they don't rerun like their packages or anything. Yeah, I know. I'm proud of that. Okay. I had to do it in like two batches because uh, sometimes when we do it like all together it says like there's not enough space but when you do it separately for whatever reason it's like you know what there is enough space. I can't find the space to put it. <laughs> These are non structurally sound. You're going, you're going right in front of the crowd. Yeah. You still have to go for it. Yeah, exactly. And they edit it for you. She'll be editing it for me. Um, laptop editing, but um, one time, um, oh no, Hunter, you haven't been here yet, but like when the previous all the previews lost power, mm -hmm. somebody hit a power line, and they lost it for like, I think they had like, wait, this, not here, it's um, up by Moscow, okay. actually in Moscow as well, um, and um, in Pullman. Um, construction workers hit it in a Vista power line and they had like, I think it was like tens of thousands of people lost power. And it was, I had to turn a pack and I think I had like 33 minutes to turn a pack. Mm -hmm. and, I was, like, and remote edit. I was like, this is, how could you even do it? Like, power gone. Well, we had our own power yeah. thing, but it's still going live, I was like, my, I sent my script back to the office and I was like, can somebody please look at, like, I literally am going live in three minutes. This is already tracked, but, like, just, whips. <laughs> I rewatched it and, like, at one point there's, like, a pan. I was like, okay, well, Thanks. but Ooh. the adrenaline of it all. Got it. Chest pains. Yes. Laptop at I hate, though. <laughs> I don't know that either. So you can pull up, pull up your file explorer. I like this link up over your app. Private or? Uh, yeah. And then go to ABCHD. Click on And then stream. And then all the clips in there. Just do like a control A. Yes. Tiny. <laughs> That's what they give me too. I, I don't know, honestly. 
I jumped in at a weird time. But, it's and a I, I've been going, so I'm like, whatever's working works. You really don't have time to stop and think about things. No. No, but like some, some of the reports have bigger cards. I guess you should just ask one. Yeah. So, do you know if all crime have a problem if they have to, to do their shows? And we don't get everything. <laughs> I mean, that's just, it's I, not I, like I, it's I, been. I it's know that I'm going to stay the whole time. I'm just wondering like where everybody else is at. Yeah. I think they know that. We're here till five. Yeah. Yeah. We're here till five. Yeah. One less uh, panic what? deadline. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but I mean, I'm at the mercy of just being here, so there's no push. This is not, the chief I already told them, reporter. Like, uh, there, I know I didn't see the title, but <laughs> she's the big dog. <laughs> Mine is just, we won't, we won't right now. Yeah, so you're welcome. Hopefully your fives are strong. Thank you. I'm going to crush. Just Berman and Andrew, you Yeah. I'm literally going to crash edit in my car, like, so fast. And I literally hate crash editing on Premiere. But, like, we use Avid otherwise, and it's very easy to crash edit on it. Premiere is too, like, I can just... It's just too much. It's like, otherwise, having to just hit buttons and it does it for you. Yeah. <sighs> Alright, it's 85. Run out before it's... Yeah, I was honestly, I didn't realize we're getting into testimony. I guess I just haven't really followed. I mean, but, I mean, it's too late. If there's time on the clock, like, they're just gonna just go. Keep going. Okay. So double check if it's already gone through, I would like pull it up. Pull it into like your program and make sure like, got it. Um, I mean, as long as it's really on like my desktop and I can just, I'll just open it. Yeah, or open a file, yeah. yeah. Usually it works fine. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Oh, beautiful camera work. You're welcome. You're going to have like a mobbing ball on the head. I'll eject it. <laughs>
so media people. Apparently, you guys are still broadcasting, and the audio is going out when the judge is off the bench because there's another clerk watching the entire proceedings. We're not broadcasting. So when the judge, the audio is picking up the audio and transmitting it when the judge is off the bench. So it's just general chit chat amongst them. He does not want that. So, so any time that the judge is not on the bench, if he's out of the room, turn off the audio. It, I, he doesn't want any audio getting picked up. Like when they're doing this cycle? No. That's when he's about. no, he doesn't have a problem with that. Sidebars are fine. And he, even when the jury is in the back room and they're discussing things with the attorneys, like right now. When the judge is not in here and everybody's just kind of commingling, talking, mm -hmm. general chit chat, he does not have, want that audio going out. Yeah, two, two seconds. We're not, Go ahead. Not, so when he's not on the bench, right? like right now, he's in the back. Yeah, that's that's totally fine. I just my stuff's all internal, so I'm not broadcasting. Anything. Okay, because broadcaster shit, it's literally going into the camera and into it in the same way. So we're so, not impacting okay. any. I have a wireless mic up there, but that's going that, straight to my camera. That's not going anywhere outside this room. Yeah. Well, apparently it is because somebody's watching one of the clerks outside of it. Well, there's a oh, zoom. There's a, that's not well, us. Well, no. our, our, our photographer, Gage, he was outside cutting audio, but that's stuff that's already been recorded, recorded from just before, the, up until the break. Is it? There's nothing that's live. There's, there's nothing that's live. That's all been recorded. Everything up until the break. But I can ask her to put in headphones. But it's nothing live. Okay. Right now. Okay. I'll put it up. But we'll make sure to do that moving forward for sure. We'll keep an eye on that. Yeah, if he's not on. Absolutely. If he's, high, if he's not yeah. sitting up there, then. And, and yeah, we don't. Yeah. All right. We don't need that. There's nothing that's not exciting anymore. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, John. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, how long did it take you to become a detective? Uh, from the time I started my career, uh, so it would have been 93. Um, I was a narcotics detective in 99. Okay. And then I had a break and went into major crimes in 2000. January 2006. Is there, uh, what kind of, were you a patrol officer before that? Uh, yes. Yeah. What kind of uh, different things did you have to learn from being a patrol officer to become a detective? Well, there's all sorts of things. Uh, various classes, um, basic academies for detectives, advanced um, academies. For detectives? For detectives. Uh, this stuff that patrol officers don't do? Uh, it's open to most patrol officers, but many don't attend. Okay. And uh, is there a difference between, say, investigating, uh, being a, a narcotics detective? Do you learn different things from being a homicide detective or a major crimes detective? Well, the basic concepts of investigations is really the same. Um, but yes. The nature of the investigation is different. How much training did you have to go through, starting with the narcotics detective? How much training did you have to do to become a detective? Well, I didn't necessarily have to do any of the training to become a detective. It was an appointment position. Okay. But to stay a detective, you had to complete training? Well, every police officer has to do so many hours of training uh, every year to keep their certifications. Okay. Let me rephrase. How long did you take in hours or uh, coursework to become an, uh, as a detective before you retired? How many hours of training did I complete during my time as a detective? Yes. Ballpark. I would say anywhere from probably 750 to 1,000, and that would be a real rough ballpark. Hours? Yeah. Okay. And uh, in there, is it fair to say your knowledge of a crime scene and the investigation that goes into it is more extensive now than when you were a patrol officer? In part of your investigation, uh, you pulled Mr. Howard's records as uh, when he was former law enforcement, correct? I'm sorry, did you? I couldn't hear that last as, part. As part of your investigation, uh, one of your search warrants was to receive the records for Mr. Howard's um, time at the police force? Yes, I did serve a search warrant on Idaho Post and uh, obtained all of his Records. Patrol Officer Howard was never a detective, correct? That's correct. You don't have any record of him attending crime scene homicide investigation, correct? That's correct. Now, in your extensive training and experience, you're taught to fill out police reports? You're taught to include all relevant information as it relates to your investigation? Yes. So in this case, there are, with all the different officers, there's uh, 46 supplements to um, this police reports ballpark? I would say that's pretty close or accurate depiction. And... For instance, uh, supplements uh, 31 uh, through 46 are all yours, correct? Uh, all but one, I believe, yes. 
And so when you uh, fill out, for instance, a, a search warrant for Bank of America records, you might wait till you get those records back and then fill out one report that encompasses both days, right? I don't understand what you're asking. Meaning every, every phone call or every day is not necessarily a separate report, correct? No. But you, everything that's relevant, you include. Yes. Okay. You filled out a police, police report of your interactions with Mr. Howard on um, the morning, uh, early morning into the morning of the 3rd of February, 2021. That's correct. In that police report, you never mentioned Mr. Howard having issues with him looking at you uh, during your conversation, correct? No, I didn't mention that. Okay. In your police report, you never mentioned Mr. Howard supposedly putting his hands in his pockets and rubbing them, correct? That's correct. Now, what, uh, did you participate in the first search warrant? As far as processing the scene? Yes. Yeah. Uh, who uh, processed the scene to your knowledge? Uh, Detective Jerry Northrup was in charge of the processing the scene, and uh, Detective Chris Kersman assisted him. Okay. Now, uh, the, there was a second search warrant conducted on the premises in February uh, that same month? That's correct. Were you present there? Um, only for portions of it. Okay. I, again, did not participate in the actual process of the scene. What uh, search warrants did you apply for? <clears throat> well, I don't have the list in front of me. Uh, the ones I applied for would have been, on top of my head, it would have been on some bank records. It would have been bank records. Percy, um, that would have been Dan Howard's retirement information, would have been Kootenai Health for Kindy Howard's met, um, employment and insurance information. Um, there was couple, several different financial institutions. Uh, I know Post, um, I'm sure there were some others. Now, you and uh, Detective uh, Northrop went up to Alaska together? No. Was it you and Oil? You and right. Mr. Uh, Detective Oil? Yeah. Went up to Alaska. And uh, part of what you were looking for was to see if Mr. Howard was having an affair? That was part of it. There was more of that. During your conversation with uh, Dan, uh, there was mention of him coming home a couple days late? Uh, yes. And he, your understanding from the conversation was that he worked a couple days late, a couple days over. That's correct. You confirmed that he did in fact work a couple days late up in Alaska, correct? Yes, we did. Uh, during that time, also, uh, in your police report, you say that uh, his co-workers didn't have anything of evidentiary value or significance? Correct. Uh, did any of them uh, describe seeing Dan as sorrowful? I don't recall that, no. Now, in the uh, course of your investigation, what other things did you, uh, did you interact with uh, some of the experts in the state in this case? Yes. Uh, did you interact with uh, a Dean Livingston? I don't believe I did. Okay. Not that I recall. 
And during this course of, so to the timeline wise, uh, do you have your reports? There? No. Okay. Are you familiar enough with the time timeline that you're able to answer ballpark dates? I think so. Okay. So uh, early on, uh, a decision was made to um, send items of evidence to Washington State Patrol, correct? That's correct. That was probably to avoid, since Mr. Howard had previously worked for ISB, as to avoid any perceived impropriety. Yeah, but I felt it's necessary to let you know that I was really not part of that decision making, uh, as I was not in charge of the investigation at that time. What, when did you become leader? Wasn't until after July of 2021. And did you review all the reports and emails and correspondence in the file for the few months prior to you taking leave? To the best of my knowledge, I did. And uh, did you review the evidence that came back in this case? I did. In fact, somewhere around uh, August of 21, um, you did an evidence review where you went and looked at the physical evidence? That sounds about right. After that time, so uh, sometime in September, you obtained a warrant for uh, Kenny's optical records? Yes, from Costco. Okay. And uh, after that, so this is now seven months removed from her passing? Correct. And in uh, um, 22, the year 22, what did you do as lead investigator in this case? During the entire year? What steps? You just hit the major milestones of what you did in 22. Well, without reviewing my reports, I couldn't sit here and tell you exactly everything that I did during that year. Okay, so you filed for a, a, a warrant for a medical record for Ms. Howard in December of 2021, correct? Say that again? You filed for a warrant for Ms. Howard's records in December of 2021. I believe that's correct. <clears throat> and that's the type of thing that you would fill out a police report for, correct? Yes. And you did in this case? I believe I did, yes. The next police report that you filled out is in August of 22, correct? That sounds about correct, yes. Okay. And that was where you go to um, the, the medical examiner's office in Spokane and review the tongue. I believe that was 23. Okay. You said 22? Uh, well, 8, 23, 22. Yeah, I believe that was Um, so after he was charged? I'm sorry? After he was charged? No, I'm sorry. 22. Okay. Right. So August 22? Yeah. I've been retired for a while. So between December of 21 and August of 22, there's no police reports that you filed out, correct? That's correct. What did you do to investigate during that time? Well, during that time, I was working on the cases for one thing. I had other responsibilities. Okay. And it was during that time frame when, you know, we were waiting for information to come back, and we were also working with various expert witnesses. Okay. When you say we, you were working with them? Uh, myself and other investigators that were involved with the case. Which witnesses were you working with? Dr. William Smock, 
and Dr. Jennifer Mara. What made you? Uh, oh, oh, strike that. Uh, the next, the next after August, the next police report you have is in uh, January twenty three, correct? I believe that's correct. Yes. And that was a search warrant for a different bank records, correct? Yeah, I believe that was the one out of Cami. Um. Then, also, that month, you filled out a police report uh, in January of 23, um, where you had a phone call with the Dr. Mock, correct? Was that January of 23 or 22? January 23. Yes, that's correct. And... The purpose of that phone call is Dr. Howard had retired at that point, correct? Yes. Was it your understand? What was your understanding of uh, what? What were you trying to have him review? Well, him as a her, Mackenzie Mott is a female, um, and I believe Mackenzie Mott called me as a follow-up. What we're looking for is there was concerns and inconsistencies with the original autopsy. Okay. And those concerns were your concerns? Uh, they were made my concerns, yes. And uh, then after that, in uh, April, you uh, fell out a police report uh, where you mentioned in the course of an interview a carotid restraint, correct? That's April of 23? A carotid restraint? Uh, I believe so, yes. And that's the first time in a police report that you have mentioned carotid restraint, correct? That's correct. Now, going back to the um, day of Kenny's passing, when you were there, um, Mr. Howard was watched by Deputy Wheeler the whole time, correct? Do you understand? I don't know if it was strictly Deputy Wheeler, but he was generally in the presence of one of the officers. So you, Detective Euler and Detective Northrop, you come in and out at different times, but you're also calling Detective Hollenbeck, correct? No. Okay. Uh, you're checking on the status of the warrant? Yes. And doc, uh, Detective Hollenbeck, apply for the warrant? Okay. We'll get to that. Um, the uh, warrant, but it, while you were out there, there were other officers. How many officers were present in the house? Well, when we first arrived, uh, I believe there was five or six officers on scene. Not all of them were in the house, um, but there was five or six there. As the evening went on, um, some of those officers left. So we had one or two there, I believe. Okay. Now, uh, when you um, overheard Kenny's daughter, emotional on the phone, you accused Dan of killing his wife, correct? Yes, I did. That's when you made up your mind? No. No further question. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Redirect, Mr. Berger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council asked you about any of your reports that you mentioned, specifically one of the ones on February 2nd, whether or not Mr. Howard was looking at you in the eye. Remember that question? Right. Yes. And you said no. Why is that? Why did I say 
Enforcement, fire, EMS responders have CAD in their vehicles? Yes. So this CAD system, um, are they able to read your notes as you're putting them in while you're on 911? Correct. Okay. And so while you're on the phone with uh, somebody calling 911, you're in constant communication with responders? Yes. And while you're um, at work as a dispatcher, you're using CAD, do you have anything else at your uh, disposal that you can record in the 911 calls? Yes. Is no. that CAD or is that something different? There's different programs we use, but um, the phone calls are recorded as is my screen and everything. Okay, so the audio of the 911 calls, that they get recorded as well? Correct. Okay. And um, does that system, um, any of the systems you use, record the date and the time of the 911 calls? Yes. Okay. When you were working on July 10th, 2020, were those systems all working? My own, yes. And um, did you receive a uh, phone call, a 911 call on July 10th, 2020? From a uh, Kenny Howard. Okay, and do you recall what time of the day that came in? Nine p.m. Nine p.m. About. Okay. And have you had a chance to go back and listen to that nine one one audio? Okay. May I approach your honor? You may. Now I'm showing you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 4A. That's a, uh, a CD, correct? Are you aware or familiar with the contents of that CD? Yes. And what is that? This is the 911 audio of the phone call you witnessed. Okay. And have you had a chance to listen to that? Yes. And is it true and accurate to your knowledge? Yes. And I'm going to go ahead and Council, real quick. So. Now, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 4B. Are you familiar with that exhibit? Yes. And what does that appear to be? This is the. I'm sorry, I'm going to say script, but I know that's the wrong word. Transcript? Transcript, yes. Transcript of, of what? Of the 911 call. Of the 911 call? That we are and have you had a chance to read that transcript while you're listening to the audio? Yes. And do they match? Yes. So um, you testified that the audio is accurate. Is the transcript accurate as well? Yes. Your Honor, um, I move to admit plaintiffs 4A and 4B at this time. Any objection? None, Your Honor. <coughs> Was there admitted? Your Honor, at this time, um, I'd like to uh, publish the audio for the jury, and as they listen to the audio, I'd like to have them follow along with the transcripts. Um, so I've got copies for bailiff. That's allowable, you may do that. <coughs> as if all the jury members have copies. Your Honor, may I uh, publish the audio? You may. Thank you.
investigation? Yes. And, and what responders were those? Uh, fire, EMS, word around, as well as law enforcement. Okay, so sheriff's deputies and then fire and EMS?
Good afternoon. Uh, so this was uh, 710 of 2020. Okay. Okay. And um, you canceled a fire and EMS, is that right? Um, law enforcement still showed up that day. No further questions. Thank you.
State calls Andrew Mohawk. Just for the jury, I, I fear, let's just keep on pressing through and we'll stop right at five. Obviously, I might keep you here past five, so we'll stop in the middle of this witness's testimony and we'll take it back up again tomorrow. Thank you, sir. If you could raise your right hand and be sworn in, please. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you, sir. If you have a seat. When you're you settled. I was just saying you may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. If you could please state your full name and spell your last for the record. Andrew Marcus Mohawk, M O H A W K. How are you employed? Full time patrol deputy with Cooney County Sheriff's Office. Were you so employed on July 10th of 2020? Yes, I was. At that time, were you a certified, post certified patrol deputy? I was. And is that standard law enforcement certification in the state of Idaho? Yes, ma'am. Were you dispatched on that day to an address in Apple? I was. Do you recall that address? I do. What is it? 30276 North Ridge. Do you recall what time of day you were dispatched? I believe I was dispatched just before 9 p.m. Why were you dispatched to that address? The call initially came out as a possible suicide attempt. When you arrived on scene, who did you make contact with? I had made contact with the boarding party, Kendi. Who else was on scene when you arrived? I believe her son, Wyatt Howard, was on scene as well. Was there another individual that you attempted to make contact with? Yes, ma'am. Who was that? I attempted to make contact with Dan Howard. And was that based on the information that you had received? Yes, ma'am. Can you describe the efforts that you made to have contact with Daniel Howard? Yes, a cell phone number was provided during the initial intake of the call, so I attempted to call that provided phone number twice. When you made contact with Kendi Howard, what observations did you make of her demeanor? Uh, initially, I noticed she was distraught, and I believe she had just gone through something traumatic, and she was crying during the first contact. When you made contact with her, you stated that this was about 9 p.m. in July. Is that correct? That's correct. I, I believe when I got, I arrived around 9.30. Did you make contact with her outside or inside? Outside. What was the um, the weather, and, and by that I really mean the lighting, like at that point? Very low light. Were you um, were you able to make uh, clear observations of the surrounding property? I wouldn't say clear. I could see tree lines and a field, but no. Did you ever go into the residence to look for Daniel Howard? I did not. Did you go into a shop or other outbuildings to look for Daniel Howard? No, ma'am. Uh, did, um, did you ever observe uh, either Wyatt Howard or Kenny Howard make contact with Daniel Howard? I did not. When you interacted with Kenny Howard, do you recall how she was dressed? I don't. Do you recall whether or not you ever spoke to Kendi Howard away from her son? No. And did she report any crimes to you? She did not. No further questions. Thank you. Press examination, Mr. Johnson. Good afternoon. Uh, were you alone when you arrived? Or was there another officer with you? There was another deputy with me. Okay, who was that? And um, during this time, um, you asked about any physical injuries. She said she didn't have any, correct? Correct. Okay. And uh, this was on 710 of 20. Sorry, may I clarify that? Yes. I, I believe I had asked if there was any uh, physical contact during the argument. And she said no, correct? She said no, correct. Okay. No further questions. Any redirects? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You may set up. I would stop at this juncture. All right. All right. I'm going to pass her than I thought. But we'll uh, rather than take another witness with seven minutes to go.
Uh, we'll just break at this time for the day. Uh, members of the jury, thank you again for your attention and your patience. And uh, I'll remind you not to discuss this matter to yourselves or anyone else, nor form an opinion as to the terms until it's been submitted to you. Uh, talk to my bailiff, or maybe they've already told you about where we'll be tomorrow at that courthouse and parties and all of that, okay? Uh, I'll look forward to seeing you there. We'll plan to start at 9 o'clock, so you show up just a little bit early so that you're here and in your seats and ready to go. We'll uh, kick things off at 9 o'clock. All right, thank you.